Good afternoon. Mel Manalis, Environmental Studies at Institute of Energy Efficiency. Um, welcome to the Institute of Energy Efficiency's Leadership in Energy Lecture Series. We are honored to have as today's lecturer Professor David McKay of Cambridge University in the UK. On behalf of the Institute of Energy Efficiency, I would like to thank Professor David Gross uh, of the Cavalli Institute of Theoretical Physics for hosting Dr. McKay's lecture and acknowledge support from Environmental Studies and the College of Letters and Science, um, Letters and Science Critical Issues in America series. After Dr. McKay's lecture, there will be a reception in a courtyard and uh, we are all invited. Now we'll introduce the speaker, David Gross. Uh, welcome all to the KATP. Uh, the KATP, the Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics, <laughs> is, is really proud to help uh, in uh, hosting this lecture this afternoon by David McKay. Um, I met David a few years ago in London at a, a conference on, on um, energy and climate. Um, it was hosted by the Prince of Wales. Was that his title? You know, Charles, Prince of Wales. It was an interesting occasion, uh, but one of the most interesting uh, benefits was meeting David McKay, who uh, gave me his book, um, which is entitled, has the same title as his talk, and I'm sure he'll describe it to you. Um, and I think you also gave a talk there. Did you give it? Yeah. O on the same topic. <laughs> and. Um, I found that absolutely fascinating. This was, um, so physicists, are, as you know, are, are pretty arrogant. Uh, they believe that, um, you know, if various problems of society and of science and technology were just given over to the physicists, pro rapid progress would be made. Uh, McKay's talk and his book are a Wonderful illustration of this. <laughs> <laughs> they, um, as you will see in this lecture, uh, in the book and in the talk, uh, David is able to um, explain uh, the basic concepts and the underlying principles behind uh, these incredibly important issues that face us without a lot of hot air and with a lot of numbers and units that make sense. Uh, I think uh, my experience was that after hearing him talk, you, you're, the way you think about many of these issues will change forever. Um, well, I don't want to, you, you, you will soon get the picture. Uh, David McKay is a, uh, I've already said, a physicist. He was educated in Cambridge and then he went to Caltech where he um, got a degree in physics working on neuroscience with a John Hopfield who was a uh, physicist, got interested in the brain and applied um, spin glass models to neural networks as an underlying mechanism for memory and other brain functions. And David has continued in that vein ever since, uh, both working on neural networks but also on other um, interesting problems and models um, in information science, um, algorithmic science, information theory. Uh, and he's had quite a distinguished career in that field, uh, which has led him to a professorship of natural philosophy. I love those titles uh, in Cambridge. But a few years ago, for whatever reason, maybe he will tell us, he got interested in 
um, issues that we're all, as citizens, interested in, uh, energy, climate, and uh, wrote this book, uh, which is, uh, had an enormous impact on um, many people all around the world. And it sort of led, uh, as far as I can tell, to a second career for uh, Professor McKay, who was appointed last year as the chief scientific advisor to the United Kingdom Department of Energy and Climate Change. It's interesting. We also have a Department of Energy, uh, but we don't add cl and climate change to it. Um, that is a, I, maybe we'll hear a bit about his, his role as a science advisor in, in Britain, uh, where they are faced um, with responding to the energy and climate issues that we are, and, and David is, is heavily involved in, in the uh, government response to those problems. Um, so uh, it really is a pleasure and a delight to, to introduce David to uh, this group in Santa Barbara. Uh, many of you I know are interested in working on these issues, and I think you will find this talk very, very illuminating. Thank you. David. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Ooh. I'll start again. Thank you all for coming. In the style of a cinema, I'd like to precede my real talk by a short entertainment. <laughs> I love back-of-envelope calculations, as many physicists do, and I was having dinner with some people from Shell, the oil company, and, and they said, hmm, if you grew the biofuels to power transport on the verge of the road, on the edge of the road, on that strip along the side of the road, how wide would the strip have to be? So this is a very nice little rough calculation to do, and you say, oh, all right, let's just take one lane of vehicles. Let's assume they're going at 60 miles per hour. Let's assume that they do 25 miles per gallon. Let's assume that the biofuel is produced uh, with 1,200 liters of biofuel per hectare per year. That's a fairly standard figure in European climates. And let's assume the vehicles are 80 meters apart. You take the first number, 60 miles per hour, and you divide it by the other three numbers, keeping careful track of units, and you find the verge would need to be eight kilometers wide to power that one line of vehicles. <laughs> Industrial revolution itself starting. And the advice from the climate scientists based on their models, which still have considerable uncertainties in them, the advice is that humanity should reduce global emissions to zero um, fairly soon with a rough indicative figure of perhaps two tons per year per person of CO2 in 2050, or perhaps one ton per year per person being strongly advised to avoid, avoid the risks of significant climate change and to keep the risk of, say, a four centigrade warming uh, below 1% or so. Today's emissions are five or six tons of CO2 equivalent per year per person. The world average um, is not, however, shared by all countries. We're not all equal. This graph reminds us of this. This visualizes country by country what the emissions are. The rectangle is the emissions of one country. The width of the rectangle is the population, and the height is the per capita emissions. And we often hear China and India are out of control. Uh, they're out of control in the sense that in the year 2000, their emissions were below the world average. Um, the per capita emissions for, uh, for India, more than a factor of two below the world average. Uh, I think the countries that are actually out of control are these ones over here, say European countries emitting uh, twice the world average, and perhaps uh, Australia, America, and Canada with emissions four times the, the world average. So, this is the uh, climate motivation, and just to remind you what one or two tons per year per person looks like on this diagram, the black line shows one ton per year per person. Uh, countries that are a, uh, examples, role models uh, for this are Bangladesh and Congo, and <laughs> two tons per year per person uh, is shown by the, the green line here. And the uh, United Kingdom government has adopted a target of reducing to that level 
uh, a 90, uh, an 80% reduction compared with 1990 levels by the year 2050. So we have our three motivations for uh, getting off fossil fuels. And uh, in response to these motivations, there's plenty of discussion going on about what to do. And some of the discussion involves emotions and loving things and hating things. And my feeling is such a large challenge that has only been met so far by Bangladesh and Congo is a challenge where perhaps we need, in addition to emotions, which play an important role, we need some facts and we need some numbers and we need some honest, uh, constructive discussion of the facts and the, the numbers. And that was my goal when I wrote the book, to try and write a factual book that would uh, uh, garner cross-party support from the nuclear, the oil, and the green uh, movements and from all political parties. And so far, it, it seems to have managed to do that. My approach is to offer a, a rough guide to sustainable energy where all the calculations and numbers are done uh, as honestly as possible and with deliberate inaccuracy as well. So all my calculations are only going to be right to one significant figure. I think inaccurate calculations are very helpful for constructive uh, conversations because inaccurate rounded numbers can be remembered and, and uh, can help you keep track of comparing things with each other, which is what we need to do to figure out plans that add up. I measure energy consumption and production all in personal units. I say how much do people use um, and how much could we produce per person from various sources. The energy unit I've settled on for measuring energy in is the kilowatt hour, which is what your electricity meter at home uh, probably reads and your utility bills perhaps tell you how many kilowatt hours you're using per month or per day. I measure powers, which is how fast we use energy, in kilowatt hours per day. This makes explicit that it's a rate of using something. Uh, the physicists and the engineers in the audience will probably spit at this point and say, why don't you just use watts or kilowatts? That's a much nicer unit rather than this ugly kilowatt hours per day thing. Well, uh, with apologies, um, I, I thought long and hard about this. A nice thing about kilowatt hours per day is first, it is a unit that the man in the street perhaps can understand. It has the per time built in. People don't understand what a watt or a kilowatt is. And secondly, the answers come out in nice numbers that you can count on, on hands or small numbers of hands, fives, tens, twenties, are the sort of powers we end up talking about. Everyday choices come in small numbers of kilowatt hours. If you take one light bulb, a 40 watt light bulb, and you leave it on for 24 hours, then you've used one kilowatt hour and it might cost you 10 cents or 15 cents. If you eat food, the chemical energy in the food you eat amounts to about three kilowatt hours per day. If you take one hot bath, you use five kilowatt hours of heat to make the hot bath. If you take a liter of petrol and set fire to it, that dissipates 10 kilowatt hours. If you have a Coke habit and you drink the Coke and throw away the aluminum can without any recycling, the embodied energy, the energy required to make the aluminum in the can was about two thirds of a kilowatt hour. So there's some everyday choices. And some choices use slightly larger amounts. If you drive an average vehicle 100 kilometers, then you use 80 kilowatt hours of energy. If you have a house, uh, sorry, if you fly, if you fly from, Los Ange from London to Los Angeles and back, you use uh, an incomprehensible number. As soon as we get into thousands, millions, billions, and trillions, we've lost people. It, it, uh, so it's essential to avoid numbers. That they all sound about the same, don't they? Though they are actually different. 10,000 kilowatt hours is the round trip energy cost. But you don't fly every day, um, or at least most people don't. And if we express it per day, assuming that you make one such trip per year, then the average rate of using energy is 26 kilowatt hours per day for, for one passenger. So again, this is in the same ballpark as driving the vehicle 100 kilometers, which you might do every day if you have a, a Los Angeles commuting lifestyle. If you have a, a house, an, a typical North American house might be using 80 kilowatt hours per day. So I think this is a, a, a good size of unit for for having conversations. Uh, here's another example. It, in London, the mayor organized a publicity campaign to in, encourage people to do seven things to make a difference and save the planet. And one of the seven things was unplug your cell phone charger when you're not using it. If every London household did this uh, when it's not in use, um, we would save 31,000 tons of CO2 and millions of pounds per year. So clearly, this is very important too. It's in thousands and millions, so that's big. Well. Let's uh, personalize it. Let's just talk about one person's cell phone charger and check. It's clearly about as evil as Darth Vader, a black planet-destroying object. Uh, here's the numbers. It's using half a watt, a uh, typical Nokia cell phone charger. 
So the energy saved by this conservation feat of switching it off for a whole day is exactly the same as the energy used by driving an average car for one second. Both of these are equal to 0.01 kilowatt hours. Now, I'm not saying don't switch it off. Do switch it off. It'll save you energy. It'll save you money. About a dollar per year is the saving you'll get from this. So switch it off. But is this the number one thing we should have in a, a publicity campaign? Should we be distracting children's attention with these sort of ideas? Should it be in the top seven? I don't think so. I think there must be many things that come above the cell phone charger in the list of important messages to convey. So let's get some numbers into the public discussion of energy options and actually try to uh, make a plan that adds up. Total British consumption adds up to 125 kilowatt hours per day per person. This unit, by the way, one kilowatt hour per day is not just the energy used by one light bulb, it's also the average power you could get out of one human servant. So a measure of uh, modern society in Europe is it's as if we all have 125 servants working for us. That's how much energy we're using through our gadgets and devices and so forth. The European average is 125 light bulbs per person. The American average is 250 light bulbs per person. Where's this going? Well, in Britain, the energy goes into transport, heating, mainly hot air and some hot water, and other stuff, much of it electrical. So a quick back-of-envelope conversation about where the energy goes is transport, heating, electricity. Now, when we talk about getting off fossil fuels, one of the prominent um, al alternatives to switch to is uh, renewable sources, and many renewables involve doing something on a land area or a sea area. And we need to talk about how much power you can get per unit area from those. The unit in which I will measure powers per unit area is going to be the SI unit, the watt per square meter. And we need to talk about population densities because uh, people um, come in various population densities. And I'll measure those in people per square kilometer, 250 people per square kilometer, is the population density of the UK. Uh, in terms of area per person, that corresponds to each person having 4,000 square meters. That's half of a premiership football field there per person. So that's the huge area on which Britain's huge renewables could be harvested. Not all countries are the same. Not all countries have the same energy consumption, and they don't have the same population density either. So the way these calculations are going to work out will depend on which country we're talking about. And this is a map of the world. This map shows on the horizontal axis the population density of a country, and on the vertical axis the energy consumption per person of the, the country. And the UK, which I was just talking about, is a fairly typical European country up in the top right here. These are other European countries in uh, this bluish color. And America is over here with a much lower population density, nearly 10 times lower. Um, and an energy consumption that is bigger by a, a factor of two. I'm using logarithmic scales here. The vertical lines show factors of 10 increase in population density as you go across to the right, and the vertical lines are showing a factor of 10 increase in energy consumption per person. In the top left-hand corner of this diagram, we have populations with remarkably low population densities and very high energy consumptions, Iceland, Canada, Australia. Top right, the same energy consumption per person about 300 or 400 light bulbs per person in Bahrain, um, but the population density is more than 100 times greater than that of Iceland, Canada, and Australia. Bottom right, Bangladesh has the same population density as Bahrain, but their energy consumption is 100 times lower, at about three light bulbs per person. Bottom left of this diagram, there's no one, but there used to be lots of people. Here's Africa. And they're all rushing up and to the right to come and join us in the top right-hand side of this diagram. Here's a few countries picked out. And the little blue tails behind some of these countries show 15 years of progress. And you can see everyone has increasing population density and increasing per capita consumption. Here's Sudan, Brazil, China, all going up and to the right. And the world average is going up and to the right. Now. A nice thing about a logarithmic diagram with population density and energy consumption per person is if you multiply those two numbers by each other, energy consumption per person times population density, you get the power consumption of the country per unit area. And these sloping lines here are straight lines because that's what happens with logarithms. These are straight lines showing contours of constant power per unit area. All of the countries that lie on this line here have a power consumption of 0.1 watts per square meter. So Bangladesh in 1990, Egypt, Jordan, South Africa, and Saudi Arabia 
all consume 0.1 watts per square meter. That's the world average. Britain over here with its higher population density and higher than world average energy consumption per capita, Britain's got a power per unit area of 1.25 watts per square meter, and the USA is halfway between those on a logarithmic scale. It's about 0.3 watts per square meter. Why is this useful? Well, renewables offer power per unit area as well, and we can put it in the same unit. So now I'm going to take this diagram and squish it down a little bit into the left-hand corner and add some more green lines which show the power per unit area roughly of some famous renewables. Let's start by talking about wind power. Wind farms in windy places in Britain deliver about 2.5 watts per square meter. And so straight away this diagram allows us to look at a country and say the UK, for example, if you covered half of it with wind farms, then the, the average output of those wind farms would equal today's total energy consumption in Britain. When I talk about energy, I'm talking about energy in all forms, not just electricity, but transport, heating, uh, fuels as well. So that's interesting. And if you did uh, the, the same for the USA, you would uh, have an, an extra factor of three or so. Um, so you would only need to cover one-sixth of the USA with wind farms to match today's consumption. Um, these rough estimates are backed up by data from real farms in, in Britain and by back-of-envelope calculations on, on roughly how much kinetic energy you can imagine getting out of wind. Uh, and so if you want to see data, it's uh, in, in the book and it's on the website associated with the book as, as well. So when it, I'm, I'm always responsive to data. If I've got any of my facts wrong, let me know and I'll update uh, the book on the website. Next, let's talk about energy crops. Energy crops in northern climates deliver something like half a watt per square meter. So the message of that is even if you cover the whole of the UK complete with, completely with energy crops, you wouldn't match today's energy consumption. America, on the other hand, if totally covered with energy crops, would just about be able to get by at today's consumption. Here's a famous energy crop called Miscanthus. Here's some data on the performance of energy crops with half a watt per square meter being uh, typical, uh, and you can get more in, uh, in the tropics, so there's more sunshine, the temperatures are warmer, so the enzymes work better. Next, uh, let's give you a table with a few more renewables in it. They all come in with the same rough number of watts per square meter as wind farms, some a little bit bigger, some a little bit smaller. Solar panels on roofs in Britain can deliver something like 20 watts per square meter. Here's data from real solar panels in Britain. and so. Straight away, you can work out if you covered all south-facing roofs with solar panels in Britain, you would get about five light bulbs per person as compared to our total consumption of 125 light bulbs per person. And so you realize if you really want solar panels to make a big difference in a European location, you need to uh, perhaps go a little bit crazy, leaf off the roof and cover the countryside with solar panels as they do in Bavaria. This is the traditional Bavarian farming method shown by this photograph here. <laughs> Once you put them on the ground and space them out, you can see the sunshine shining through the gaps between the panels, and the actual power per unit land area delivered by this solar park is only five watts per square meter, which is twice as good as the wind farm we started with. Um, and the message for the UK then would be solar parks like this, if covering one quarter of the country, would on average match the total power consumption of Britain in all forms. And there's a very similar message for places like Massachusetts and New Jersey, whose population density is the same as the population density of Britain. Next up, let's talk about tidal pools. Tidal pools have been used for centuries, and uh, here is one on the east coast of Britain, and here's one in France, and it delivers 2.7 watts per square meter. It's a, a simple back-of-envelope calculation to, to check that uh, figure using things to do with uh, water density and gravity and heights. And 2.7 watts per square meter is just like wind farms. So we already know the answer. If you want a tidal pool to make a really big contribution, you need a tidal pool not the size of a small estuary, but a tidal pool the size of a country. And God, in his wisdom when he created the British Isles, provided the British with exactly such a facility. It's called the North Sea. The North Sea is an enormous natural tide pool in and out of which and round which great sloshes of water pour every 12 hours. And one way of getting energy is to exploit this natural countryside tide pool, put underwater windmills in the places in yellow on the map there with big currents. And here's an underwater windmill which has just been plopped into the water near Northern Ireland. 
No one's deployed these things on the scale of um, upstairs wind farms yet, but we can anticipate what the power per unit area is by simple physics calculations. Water's density is a thousand times bigger. The speeds we can look up. And we find that underwater wind farms will deliver something like eight watts per square meter. So that's three times better than the upstairs wind farms, but we still need the total of all of those underwater wind farms to be getting on for country-sized. Next, rainwater. Hydro, it's a big renewable worldwide. You can work out the power available from rainfall by taking the height above sea level and the rainfall arriving at sea level and multiplying those by g, the, the strength of gravity. And you find for highland locations in the British Isles that the power per unit area of that arriving rainwater is about 0.24 watts per square meter, smaller than the wind farms. So the message hasn't changed. The final renewable on this list here is concentrating solar power in deserts. These beautiful mirrors here deliver something like 15 or 20 watts per square meter of land occupied by the solar power station. So that's better than wind farms, but not orders of magnitude better. So we still have the overall message. To make a difference, renewable facilities have to be country-sized. Now, we do have a constraint um, on us when we're making plans for the future that at the moment, we live in uh, democracies, Britain and America, and in democracies, we have to have consultation exercises. And here's a photograph of a consultation exercise in full swing in the little town of Penicook, just south of Edinburgh. And you can see the children of Penicook celebrating the burning of the effigy of the windmill. Because if there's one thing the British people are good at, it's saying no. And here's a few more organizations expressing their views on wind farms. So uh, what to do about that? Well. Um, you could say, uh, let's go offshore to get away from the objectors. And there's a problem that the uh, offshore wind farm proposals are also met by opposition. They ruin the scenery, they ruin the view, they're bad for airports, they're bad for surfers, and uh, fishermen oppose offshore wind farms. Last but not least, the military couldn't possibly cope with having uh, wind farms because it would ruin the security. They couldn't defend us from the Russians anymore if, if we had wind farms ruining the radar. So uh, what to do? Um, after you've had all of these consultation exercises, it, given the current public attitude to renewables, a country like Britain with its population density may struggle to actually match today's consumption with any mix of renewables. A rough cartoon of what you might be able to get with a big push and lots of consultation exercises is perhaps alongside this red stack which represents today's 125 light bulbs of consumption of energy in all forms. Maybe you could get about 17 kilowatt hours per day per person uh, from a, a mix of renewables. This is just a rough, a rough cartoon of what I can imagine we might be able to deliver in a place like Britain or Massachusetts or New Jersey. So how can we make a plan that adds up for a region like this? And what should we think about other regions like California where population densities are a little bit lower and sunshine shines a little bit more strongly? Well, we can take action on the demand side. We could say there's no need to use 125 light bulbs per person. We can easily reduce demand. Uh, we could do that in various ways. Uh, by reducing population. Um, I'm not sure of friendly ways to do that. We could get people to change their lifestyle, um, but I feel a bit scared of recommending lifestyle change when I find people driving off-road vehicles, parking on the grass with cars that have teeth. <laughs> and so the strategy I've gone for is to suggest, yes, lifestyle change obviously could make a difference to transport, heating, electricity, and other things, but let's leave that to one side on the table and let's discuss the other options on, on this diagram. Let's talk about technology and efficiency because uh, we can be techno-optimists and say, oh yes, we can make things far more efficient. Uh, I'm sure you heard Amory Lovins uh, talking in this lecture series about how we could make things 10 times more efficient easily. So let's try and have a, a hard look at the technology and efficiency side of things. And we could always come back to the lifestyle change if after doing that and then looking at the other supply side options, we, we find we're not comfortable with the, the sort of plan we end up with. On the supply side, other options if we can't transform the public attitude to renewables include clean coal, which means that we carry on using fossil fuels, but just in a different way that puts carbon dioxide in a hole in the ground. Nuclear power, which is also a fossil fuel and has various popularity problems of its own. 
And thirdly, we could very politely ask other countries, we don't want to have all these renewables in our, our backyard, please can we have them in your backyard because you've got such a plentifully large backyard. And for the United States, you could think of the individual country, the individual states of the USA as being equivalent to the countries I'm imagining here. So New Jersey and uh, Massachusetts could very politely ask Arizona to, to have solar panels in, in their desert so as to sort out the energy uh, crunch that New Jersey and Massachusetts might otherwise be feeling um, as they try to get off fossil fuels. So let's talk about the technology and efficiency options and try and have a, a realistic view of what could be done there. For this discussion of efficiency options and technology switches, I'll just use a cartoon. I'll say the energy is going into transport, heating, and electricity. What can we do to make transport much more efficient? Well, here are the five physics principles that you want to apply. <laughs> First, you want your vehicle to have small frontal area per person so as to reduce air resistance. Second, you want your vehicle to have small weight per person to reduce rolling resistance and braking losses. Third, you want to convert energy efficiently from one form to another. Standard petrol and diesel engines are only 25% efficient at turning chemical energy into oomph, and that's not very good. Fourth, go slowly to reduce air resistance and braking losses. And fifth, go steadily to reduce the braking losses. So we, let's apply all five of those principles and see what technology we end up with. We start from the standard single occupied vehicle, uh, which uses 80 kilowatt hours to deliver 100 person kilometers of transport. And we say, apply lots of those principles, and we end up with this, a bicycle uh, whose energy consumption is one kilowatt hour per 100 person kilometers. So that's 80 times as good as the car we started from. So Amy Lovins is right, technology can make a difference. But the lady on, in the tank on the left might say, no, 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 that's a lifestyle change. I couldn't possibly ride a bicycle. I want to zoom around in a big metal box. So here's, here's another metal box that the lady in the tank could be offered uh, to zoom in. This public transport, this train, uses six kilowatt hours per 100 person kilometers. That's 10 times as good, more than 10 times as good as the fossil fuel vehicle we started from. But the lady in the tank might say, no, 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 I can't possibly travel with all those horrible people. So she requires an individual box to zoom in. So let's apply uh, all the technology pushes we can think of. And we end up with uh, this little eco car. It comfortably accommodates one teenager. It's shorter than a traffic cone, and it is almost as good as a bicycle in its energy consumption. But to deliver this performance of just 1.3 kilowatt hours per 100 person kilometers, you have to drive it at 15 miles per hour. Maybe this isn't a satisfactory technology switch. We want something that looks a little bit more normal. But if you have something that is about this big and you can sit in and it zooms along, it creates swirling air behind it. It will have air resistance. There's no way of getting around that. But we can attack the efficiency of conversion of energy between different forms. And petrol and diesel engines are only 25% efficient. Electric vehicles are about 85 or 90% efficient at turning chemical energy in the battery into oomph at the wheel. So here is an opportunity to have a big saving, a factor of four saving in energy consumption if we switch to electric vehicles. And here's uh, some electric vehicles in Britain. And then this is a fish in somewhere in California whose energy consumption is uh, more than 10 times uh, better than the fossil fuel vehicle we started from. 21 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers is the consumption of this uh, slightly strange Indian-made electric vehicle in London, and that's measured at the socket using a power meter. And you might say, ah, oh, but the electricity came from burning a chemical at a power station, and if that's only done with an efficiency of 35% or so, then we haven't really won anything, and, and that's, that's true. If you make electricity that way, then this switch to electric vehicles doesn't give us a great win. But we don't have to make electricity by burning chemicals at power stations with an efficiency of 35%. We could get electricity from other sources, like windmills, for example. So I think electric vehicles deserve to be firmly on, on the table as, a, as an efficiency option, as long as we bear in mind the, the need for green, uh, efficient electricity. Electric vehicles have been around for a long time. There's Edison, top left, and a world speed record holder, top right, um, who set the world speed record in 1899 in an electric vehicle. There's lots of electric, electric vehicles being talked about at the moment. Hopefully, they, they will become widespread. And some of them look like muscle cars and have energy consumptions even lower than 20 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. And some of them have crazy looking doors and get even lower than that. 
And electric scooters are perhaps the most el energy efficient electric vehicles of all, using just three kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. So technology can make a big difference. And a transitional technology that we could go through to get to electric vehicles might be plug-in hybrids, which have a little petrol or diesel powered engine uh, hidden away um, to recharge the electric battery if you go too far and run out of juice. And there seems to be some obligation that plug-in hybrids have to look like killer robots from the future. I'm not quite sure why. Uh, but how much energy do these use, this transitional technology? Well, the Volt claims to use 25 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. So that's not quite as good as the electric vehicles, but it's pretty close. And so I think it's a, a very good transitional technology to help us get the electric vehicle infrastructure up and running. Now, what about heating? Here, we have a very different situation in Britain, obviously, from other uh, locations like California, where your concern isn't heating, it, it may be air conditioning that's guzzling lots of energy. But let me just talk you through the technology uh, challenge for Britain anyway. Why do we need lots of heating? It's because we have crappy buildings. This is my house with the Ferrari out front. It loses heat in the winter, and the heat loss is the product of the leakiness of the building and the temperature difference between the inside and the outside. The power required to make up that heat loss is the heat loss divided by the coefficient of performance of your heat creation system. And that would be true for making hot water as well, that you make hot water uh, by using power, and uh, the power required is the heat that you want divided by the efficiency of some heat making system. And we can reduce the power required for hot air and hot water by attacking the three color terms on the right hand side here. Reduce the temperature difference between the inside and the outside of your building in the winter, this can be done by an amazing piece of technology called the thermostat. You grasp it, you rotate it to the left, and your energy consumption will go down. If you turn down your thermostat in Britain by one degree Celsius in the winter, you'll reduce your energy consumption by 10%. Um, I've turned down my thermostat by five degrees uh, on average in, in the winter, and it reduces my energy consumption by 50%. Some people call it a lifestyle change. It works. <laughs> Um, we can also reduce the leakiness of the building. In Britain, you can do this by getting the fluff men 